Welcome to the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nedling. You are about to discover impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you, so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Be sure you visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com. While you're there, subscribe to us via your favorite network. Now tune in, get ready, and enjoy the journey of emerging as a leader of exception in the 21st century. Welcome everyone to the Find Your Leadership Confidence podcast. I'm your host, Vicki Nethling, coming to you from Roswell, Georgia. The goal of this podcast is to bring topics and guests that will empower you to become that confident leader and take your business and your life to the next level. Today, I am so excited to have Terry Short as my guest. And let me tell you a little bit about Terry. She is a human potential developer and has been a coach in some capacity her entire career. She has more than 30 years of leadership experience a master's in business administration, healthcare management, her professional coach certification, and is a certified patient experience professional. Through her coaching, speaking, and facilitating, she has inspired countless staff, senior leaders, physicians, and middle managers to connect to their why and to harness the power of empathy and personal relationships. She excels in assessing complex situations, challenges, and helping others break them down with clarity and actionable steps. She is the author of The Words We Choose, your guide to how and why words matter, which was awarded 2020's American Book Fest finalists. Congratulations. She has been interviewed by various media, including Fast Company and NPR. I chose the title today to be Communication is Key, Listen Expertly, and Speak with Intention. Please welcome my guest, Terry Short. Thank you, Vicki. Such a great background, my goodness. And it's so tied to what I talk about in my leadership track, which is leading with the head, the heart, and the hands. That's just completely tied to that. Awesome. We start with a very easy question for you, and it is tell our audience, where do you live? You know, you think that's an easy question. Not so much. (laughs) (laughs) So I am currently on the banks of the Henry's Fork River, it's the Henry's Fork of the Snake River in Idaho. I lovingly say, in the middle of nowhere, Idaho. Which oh, my is. goodness. Uh, we do that in the summer. So mid-May to mid-October. And then I'm in Monterey, California, when I'm not in New Zealand. Oh, <laughs> whoa. We have to just do a podcast. You know, I'm going to start next year another podcast called It's Just a Conversation with Vicki. Mm-hmm. And I'm just going to have people that I think are cool and have cool stories. And so we're going to have to find out about your not nomad life that you have. <laughs> it's all good. Yeah, I love it. So what is the significance of the words we choose? Mm. It means everything. And that's why I wrote the book, because it, uh, the words we choose inform, first and foremost, our internal narrative. Yeah. And that internal narrative drives everything else. And so... When we um, get an if, that's a word choice there, Mm -hmm. but when we um, become much more cognizant of choosing words that truly represent us and and combining the words into a narrative that is supportive and representative, then it changes everything. So that's the foundation of the significance. Awesome. And how do words impact one's inner narrative? Right. So that so that's chapter one of the book. And what <laughs> you do in chapter one is say, okay, so if we're going to talk about choosing words that serve you, um, let's think first also about the ones that you've accepted along the way. So whether it was from a parent um, or it was from a teacher or, or friends or what have you, 
um, do those words still serve you? you? We all know the story of the child that was told, you'll never be a great musician or you'll never be a great artist. And they believed that for some amount of time, right? And so it starts to impact what our own belief system. So I take that and then I weave in emotional intelligence mm, yeah. and how we grow our emotional intelligence, which I know is a, a, a part of your confidence building. Yes. And we grow that by very intentionally serving or choosing words that serve us better. Mm. And my suggestion is that one first dives into what, what their values are. It's so often I ask people, you know, what are your top five values? And they go, (laughs) 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 not so sure. So we sort of start there. I always suggest people look up the Brene Brown list of values as a place to start. And then, and then take all that information what you've heard before, what the stories that are driving you, your your sense of emotional intelligence. And I Mm -hmm. break that down, what your values are and pull that all together and say, this is what I choose my narrative to be so it's a it's a much more proactive approach to informing your inner narrative yeah it, and it is and i often t- when i'm talking to people about this we we mention the fact that the words that we say to ourselves that we choose to say to ourselves can be so hurtful can be so yes. damaging and and we don't even think about it and, right. and the other side of that is that other people are watching and listening. And, mm-hmm. and if, if you say those things, then how can you expect them to give you any good regard or, or respect? Because you don't obviously even respect yourself. That's exactly right. You know, in the book, I, I do a little um, overview of a book called Reviving Ophelia. I don't know if that rings a bell to you. So it was an older book. And when my kids were first born, it had already been published for a bit and they're in their 20s. And then there was a 25-year revival or or re-edition of it. Um, And the woman did it with her daughter. And so it's, you know, they brought it present. And then so that, that book was so instrumental when the kids were little in exactly what you just said. Like I, if they heard me say, I mean, they were never going to hear me say something about my weight, something about my capabilities, because they, you know, when I'm offering that to them, then they're going to turn around and think about a mm-hmm. what that means about their mom, but then how they're going to choose such words in the future as well. Right? Yeah. 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 So very true. So which words limit or minimize and which ones elevate and inspire? Yeah, so I have a funny little list, and uh, I'm going to go through some of them with you. So since you ask it in that manner, we'll do the limiting ones first. First. Henry Ford was way ahead of us on this when he said that whether you believe you can or you can't, you're right. Yes, exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. So can't is a very limiting word Yeah. and very limiting. And all you do, and you've probably seen that meme, you just cut off the T and you speak about what you can do. And so maybe you're not practiced or ready enough that to be able to say I can do this with the violin or play this Mm -hmm. particular song don't talk about what you can't do lean into what you can do and so therefore not be limiting yourself so that's a number one limiter um I believe a very limiting word is should yeah Yeah. that was right in my mind I was like I know (laughs) the next word (laughs) yeah when we choose should we are absolutely really uh, put out there because somebody else said so mm. because society said so because my mother said so because my boss said so so even when you're a leader when you say to the team we should do this mm. when leader says that to me i say well, well why <laughs> like you yeah. know you know but because that's indicating to me the the owner of this thing i should do is not my boss mm. like they're they're putting that ownership on someone else and so should is incredibly limiting any way you slice it, it's very, very limiting. So I encourage people to think about what they want to do or what they what their desire is, not what they believe they should do. Yeah. One of my coaches um, said, instead of saying should, when you're trying to coach or instruct, you you should you should, there you go, go. You would use the words in my experience. And mm-hmm. therefore it's not 
pushing on your style. It's leaving it open to discussion, if you will, whether or not you use it. Yeah. Whenever I hear anybody say, should, you should do this. And I mm -hmm. mean, sometimes a relative says that to me, I think, says who? You're not the boss of me. <laughs> right. And it, it's, a, it's like the, um, when we say they said, um, they say, or they say that, you know, mm -hmm. next year, this is going to happen. I mean, who are they? And yeah. to me, should, we should, con we should consider should <laughs> the same way is that it's something that's uh, potentially imposed upon us. Yes. And when we're choosing to say that we're owning that imposition and we're not um, stepping into what we really believe. Otherwise we'd be saying it differently. We'd be offering that differently. Yeah. And, and we would never grow and develop. Okay. I, I'd like to often think about um, everything that we do. It has internal GPS. And yes. if you are shooting everybody, then yeah. you you may not come across a better, more efficient, more fun way to do something exactly. because it's what you were sh you should do, and and therefore the creativity yes. and innovation is kind of squashed down. Yes, absolutely. Yes. So I'll offer at least one more, and that's but. That's no. <laughs> very limiting. <laughs> yeah, very limiting. It's just chops off whatever that thought was, whether it's your own. When sometimes we, we speak in terms of our own things. I, you know, I, I'm here to share my presentation of the project we've been working on for the last six months, but we're not going to be able to, then I've just like, I've just diminished Everything. what I'm about to do and the work that I've been doing, right? So sometimes mm -hmm. we do it to ourselves and sometimes we're not expertly listening as per the title when someone says, anything and we offer but we're mm -hmm. severing that thought process right yeah. I, I one of my talks i it mentioned that i part of my way of developing though as a leader was i had my very first supervisor in my first job always gave me butt reviews <laughs> and in those early days, I always was so frustrated. I thought, oh God, if I could just get a review without that, but <laughs> good, 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 but. And then I realized that all those buts weren't adding pounds to my hips, but they actually were sharpening my tools to um, be better. So it, it, I guess sometimes it's how you use the butt, but maybe there was a different word she could have used <laughs> to sharpen right. my yeah. tool. Here's the different word. The replacement yeah. word is end. You're doing particularly well at this, Vicky, and, you know, or, you know, executed such and such well. Mm -hmm. And she wanted to say, but you missed an opportunity to do this or whatever that was. I'm assuming it was something along those lines. Instead, yeah, very much so. <laughs> yeah, she could have very easily said, and the next step would be to pay more attention to this. Yeah, that's a great. Right? So it, it would, it would make you feel so much more um, inspired <laughs> and you would be more elevated into that next step as opposed to, but, because you're hearing mm -hmm. it as, you know, didn't do that. And, and it actually is more empowering because, yeah. and leads you to believe that there is a, an acceptable, another way to do things. And, That's right. And it it's does an also, it, it, it mm -hmm. wasn't, you must do it this okay. next way it's opening yeah. up for you to say do you want to do it or not that's right it's an extender it's a it's a collaboration it's a you know we're all in this together and yes <laughs> yeah. yes so. very good mm -hmm. all right so how do you um, as a busy person prioritize and i talk about this on my podcast all the time your well-being you know, interestingly enough, right before this call, I had a client call and the entire focus of the call was about that. And so this gentleman was showing me his calendar. This is pretty common. And I was doing a little bit of a diagnosis, right? And so first, let me back up and say, in my perfect world, and I actually offer this as a re free resource on my website, we would all start with a calendar that was pre-filled in with our well-being things. Yeah. Right? That's how mine is. I start the year, I say, okay. I want to meditate at this time. I want to do yoga. I want to work out. I want to, what, what do I want? What, what, what does well-being look like to me? Mm -hmm. I'm going to put that in first. 
And a lot of people say, well, so the, the first thing they'll say is when I say, you know, what do you do well-being wise for yourself? They say, well, it's inconsistent. I don't, you know, always take a walk at lunch or do this or whatever. And I say, well, let me show it to me on your calendar. It's not on the calendar. Mm -hmm. Well, of course it's inconsistent because you're waiting for it to the perfect time to occur. And the reality is that we are calendaring humans now. It's how mm -hmm. we live our lives. Right. So why fight that? Mm -hmm. Why not lean into that and say, that's how I live my life. And so therefore I'm going to prioritize my well-being just as I prioritize conversation with my direct reports, my boss or what have you. I'm going to put this in there and I'm going to color code it to a color that makes me feel good. And when I see that color, I'm energized already because it's time now for me, whether mm -hmm. it's 15 minutes of reflection time in the mm -hmm. afternoon, it's 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 baked in there and it, I'm prioritizing the well-being. I'm not waiting for someone else to do it for me. So that's really the trick is that very busy people, particularly those who do have bosses, right? So I'm my circumstance, I am the boss now. Yay. <laughs> but there are times when that's not the case and you feel almost the victim of the meetings and the things that come on. And for this is back to word choices. For as long as you believe you're the victim, you will be. Yeah. But when you say, I'm going to take more control of this and I'm going to take a move in the direction of what's most important to me. And you'll, you'll start to see that, particularly, I like to call it normalizing well-being, particularly when we start talking about it, other people in the workplace will say, oh, I'm going to do that too. I'm mm -hmm. going to put down mm -hmm. that I'm going to walk after lunch. And yeah. then it starts to become more normal. So that's how I prioritize it. And that kind of brought to mind. So for me, I have my two grandsons here and I don't get them for two days in a row very often. And yeah. so I had people that booked podcasts <laughs> like you. And so I thought, oh, I just emailed them and said, I, I can't do this today. Let's reschedule because I have my grandbabies and, I, yeah, and right. I'm going to yeah. be taking care of them. And so and not feel guilty about it. Yeah, but, that's right. Um, yeah, and that's a that's a choice. I love that. It's a great example because when we feel depleted, I get it that it's really hard once you're depleted. And I've I've been there, and it, and it happens, right? It's not like it never happens, but when you get mm -hmm. to the place of feeling depleted, it's not easy to even find the time yeah. to pause long enough to create the time in the future, mm -hmm. which is what I'm suggesting that people do is that they pause long enough to say, I'm going to prioritize me. It's going to look like this and, you know, make something realistic or shoot the moon and then back off from that, but mm -hmm. start somewhere because yeah. for as long as you're allowing others and the meetings and the whirlwind control or your podcast control you know what what your time frame and you're not taking ownership of it then there's not going to be that sense of well-being yeah. you're not going to have the time with the grandkids so i love, and, that. I love and the ownership. one of the other things that i found you know when we were working my husband and i so there you knew nine to five or seven mm -hmm. to six <laughs> whatever it is <laughs> you weren't going to be available so whenever the other person books something they knew, okay, well, I can't book it during this time. Well, now both of us are retired. Uh, I have a, a, a warped sense of what to do during retirement in his mind, but I now calendar invite him to things <laughs> so that they know. And my daughter, now I have her with the grandkids I, having, sending me calendar invites to the ball games and things like that, because if it's not on my calendar, it's not going to happen. And That's so right. um, right. I'm training them. <laughs> yeah, I love it because it it's the way we live our lives. So why fight it? Why, why? And also then why prioritize that I can live my life this way work-wise, but not prioritize it for mm -hmm. my own well-being? That's what I'm saying. It's like, that's a disconnect. And where the, the individual owns the connection. And I'm mm -hmm. on a mission to make that a greater connection of well-being, particularly well-being and leadership. A greater Perfect. Overlap. Awesome. So what does neuroscience tell us about that word, 
procrastination. <laughs> I love this part. I'm so glad you asked me this. I've been geeking out on the neuroscience. Mm -hmm. I just love it. I did a neuroscience, uh, uh, neuro mindfulness certification, and I, I learned so much. I just, I, I think everybody should do it. Yeah. <laughs> anyway, so what it, what basically, here's the bottom line of what it teaches us, that procrastination is irrational. Mm -hmm. It's irrational because it, we choose to do it as a response to something else. So it's a, it's a response to an emotional something else, some anxiety or anger or something that's rubbed us some way and uh, provoked an emotion. And so we choose to procrastinate because it's a, it's a short fix to it. Like, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm not going to do that because you know, so-and-so told me so, or I don't have to, or, mm -hmm. you know, anything that makes me feel better to put it off. And it's a momentary feeling, uh, a better feeling. It's, it's <laughs> they might think it's short. hard. Yeah, that's right. Because I'm, because I'm afraid, or I think I'm incapable, yeah. or it's hard, yeah. or whatever. So I, it's irrational. It's an irrational response, because we're choosing yeah. to do something that's go, we already know is going to make us feel worse. <laughs> Right, we know that. So there are there are steps that um, that one takes to combat that. And you know, it's it's a spectrum. People procrastinate kind of on a spectrum. Like you and I probably would place ourselves somewhere different on the spectrum. And at any given time in our lives, based on what we have going right, on, right. grandkids are here, what have you, where we move on that spectrum. And and it, the very first thing to understand, though, is the neuroscience part is that it's an irrational response. So ever since I've learned that, I might think to myself when I'm choosing to procrastinate on something, I think, oh, I get it now. I'm choosing this irrational approach. <laughs> like I'm choosing to be irrational and I don't want to be irrational. So that in of itself has helped me kind of rethink and reprioritize yeah. things that I want to focus on. Oh, so good. Yeah. So it's time for rapid fire. And uh, so what makes multitasking a myth? <laughs> oh my gosh. It's because we multitasking makes us use two different sides of our brain. Mm -hmm. So we're actually task switching is what mm -hmm. we're doing. And the, the best articles about this are the articles about um, distracted driving. There are a lot of them and they absolutely straight up prove you, you will not even go to change your radio station <laughs> when it wants to read such articles because the concentration to do one task and then task switch to the other one, that's where memory suffers. It's where the connection of the focus suffers. And so it's a myth. It's a myth yeah. that we do it. So what we, many of us, what, when I first heard this, Vicki, I was like, wait a minute. First of all, 3% of the human population can effectively multitask. So I thought, Oh, well, maybe I'm part of it. <laughs> like my immediate thought, right? That is not true. And so what we what we do, those of us who can handle many things, you single task masterfully. You single mm -hmm. task really, really well. You go this thing, get it done, cross it off, and I do this yes. thing. And so it seems like you're doing multiple things, but you're really single tasking masterfully. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I can't walk and chew gum at the same time. So. <laughs> what are some key strategies, though, to getting things done? Mm. All right. Well, I made up an acronym for that, and that it's FAST. So focus, align, and single task. So let's say you're back to your calendar, and now you're, you're so good at calendaring that for anything that's a must-do, you've also blocked the prep time to do that thing. And now I'm in that prep time, comes up on my calendar, and I say, okay, here's what I need to do. I need to focus. And when I say focus, I might actually do, I don't know if you're familiar with mudras. This is a mudra, like a hand something. This is the mudra for focus. So I might take three deep breaths to move myself from what I was just doing being on the podcast with oh. you to move me to focus now and get my mind oh. and heart all in the right place. Right. And so I'm going to do three deep breaths, less than a minute. I'm going to spend less than a minute <laughs> right, to focus. And then I'm going to align with what it is I intended to accomplish during this time. And then I'm going to single task. I'm going to go like this laser focus <laughs> on oh. this and I'm going to single task. That's great. So focus yeah. aligns. Single task, F-A-S-T. Yes. And 
So how do busy people, particularly leaders, juggle competing demands? And we, you know, you're called pulled five different ways. Yes. And that's never going to change. And yeah, so that's gotten is, worse yeah. over time. We have the information overload makes it makes there be more competing things and we, are, we can't change that. But what we can change is our approach to those things. So I'm going to paint the picture for your audience that's listening in. So mm -hmm. think about a teeter totter. So you have a teeter totter and on the teeter totter, you have geometric shapes. So big, these are all your competing demands, big triangle, big circle, three little balls, a star. So you have some paint the picture of some geometrical mm -hmm. shapes on the teeter-totter. And based on all those shapes, you got a big trapezoid on the end, it's it's teetering, right? It's the way then, and we have this sense that, a false sense in my mind, that our job is to keep it balanced. And that's how we set about handling, let's say, competing mm -hmm. demands. Well, I suggest we're going about it all wrong, particularly in this information age and with so many competing demands. First of all, there's a whole art to deciding what gets to be on that bar. Are you de delegating properly? Are you saying no properly? Mm -hmm. Are you reducing the size? Let's say it's a big uh, circle on the end, but it's really three smaller balls that you can break down. So there's like the reorganization mm -hmm. of the things that are on the bar. But the key is that once you learn to center yourself, calendar properly, really get yourself aligned, then I propose you choose to be the fulcrum. So right now we say, we always put the fulcrum in the middle mm -hmm. and we say, well, all this craziness happens and it can teeter one way or the other. What I'm proposing is that by way of being very intentional about calendaring your time and then being fast when you get to that time, focused, aligned, and single task, be the fulcrum. Move yourself to that which you desire to accomplish. Yeah. And, accomplish and that's how you juggle the competing demands. Oh, very good. Very good. So it is time now for us to share my screen. So if you have been listening in and have not taken notes, that's uh, shame on you, but uh, it, it is time to get that pencil and paper if you're just listening in. And I'm going to share her contact information. And if you um, aren't where you can do that, if you're listening in your car or driving, it, all this information will be on my YouTube as well as my website, so you can see. So you can go to her website, which is https colon forward slash forward slash www.thrivingleadercollaborative.com. Again, thrivingleadercollaborative.com. She can be found on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn by her name, Terry Short. And I'm going to let her talk to you about the few things that she has um, as a call to action. Thanks, Vicki. Well, first of all, on the website, thank you for saying that um, so clearly. It's a long one. Um, on the website, there are lots of free resources. One is the first chapter to my book that you awesome. can download for free. But the calendar template I mentioned, uh, lots of different articles and resources for the um, prioritization and the information on multitasking and all that. It, there's just tons of resources there. Okay. And we pull that all together once a year in an annual retreat, which is coming up September 14th to 23rd of this year in Estes Park, Colorado. Mm -hmm. And I'd love to do a special offering for your listeners alone and call that, call that confident me. We'll make, we'll make a code confident me for 30% off of attendance to the retreat where we're basically going to do three things there. We're going to from prioritize well-being and make, su make sure that everyone knows what that's all about. We're going to refine spiritual and, and intuitive intelligence, and we're going to elevate one's inner narrative. That's those word choices. So that's how we pull it all together in, a, in an immersive weekend. Awesome. Again, that is September 14th to 17th, three nights in Colorado. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And uh, you can get this information by going to... Uh, thrivingleadercollaborative.com, as we mentioned earlier. And if you use the code CONFIDENTME, you can get 30% off until, um, you know, well, she's going to probably sell out. So uh, act quickly. 
you shared so many great tips and information. It's been just a joy to have uh, this time as converse, have a conversation with you about everything. I will remember focus, align, single task. So I will yeah. remember to be strategic as uh, getting things done by fast. <laughs> And we do Thank want you. to get things done fast, but if we're okay. um, focusing and aligned, I think we'll get them done not only fast, but well. That's right. So um, as I always do, I remind everyone that life is a journey and it's up to you to enjoy the ride. This is Vicki Nettling signing off. Thank you for tuning into the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast with Vicki Nettling where we share impactful lessons that help you grow as an individual, grow your confidence, and find the positive and good within you so you powerfully and authentically become the best version of yourself. Remember to visit our website at www.findyourleadershipconfidence.com and enjoy even more great episodes like this one. Again, while you're here, subscribe to us via your favorite network. We look forward to seeing you next time on the Find Your Leadership Confidence Podcast.